Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Immaculate Podcast, where we talk about all things fashion. Today, we're joined by Linda Sumbu, who is a fashion commentator who has accumulated a large following on social media. Linda is known to give praise to any designer, large or small, for their unique tastes in designs. Linda also likes to comment on red carpet events and has this uncanny ability to post photos of runway collections faster than Vogue runway themselves. She is a must follow for any kind of fashion commentary and inspiration. So welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're kind of uh, you're kind of like the queen of fashion Twitter, in my opinion. So uh, everybody seems to follow you and like you and comment on everything you post. And yeah, you have like such a big following. So I'm, I'm happy you're here. I'm really flattered. I, don't, I wouldn't call I wouldn't call myself the queen of high fashion Twitter. I don't think I don't think that exists. But I'm flattered that so many people seem to like me and follow what I talk about. Because I often feel like when I speak about stuff, I'm just talking out of my ass. So I don't know if I make sense half of the time. But I guess people seem to think that I make sense. No, I I mean I I. I think uh, everybody that's like into fashion, whether it's just like looking at photos or finding commentary or talking about designers, um, I think everybody should follow you. So um, I'm really happy I found you on Twitter. And like I said, thanks again for being here. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. So uh, I want to start at the very beginning. Um, so like if you could just give us a quick background on like where you grew up and like what are your early memories of like being into fashion when you were like a child and a teenager? um you know growing up or you did okay so for me i grew up in the drc democratic republic of congo and when i was a child i i, I pretty much grew up on the same stuff that a lot of little girls did so like you know barbies and brat dolls and everything and i think that's where my obsession with fashion started i remember when i was little like I loved fashion. I think my mother loved fashion more than me and I, I think I kind of inherited that from her. But like ever since I was little, I just loved fashion at a very surface level, obviously. Like I wanted to be a stylist and stuff like that at some point. And I thought I, I thought that I was the coolest, most stylish person ever because <laughs> I had one of those sticker books that you had as a child that you could like put on the dolls and stuff like that. I thought I was so cool. But yeah, I would say that like between like Barbies and Bratz and stuff, like I feel like it had a very big impact on me because ever since then I've I've just not stopped loving like fashion and stuff like that. Like it was just very much something that like I grew up with. Funny enough, I did lose a lot of passion for it in when I turned like, you know, I became a teenager and I went through a phase where I was like, I hate everything pink and I hate anything yeah. girly and stuff like that. And I got a lot more into video games. But, you know, what's interesting is that I was also huge into video games when I was younger, like as a child as well. But then I was into fashion games. So I would spend like hours and hours playing fashion video games like online, like Girls Go Game and everything with like the Bratz games on the Wii. So I feel like that's very much the origin of where my passion for fashion comes from. And I think it just blossomed a lot better when I became an adult. And I just kind of, it just kind of came back to me. You know what I mean? Like I went through a long phase of just not caring about it, but still knowing about it arbitrarily because my family it kind of knows something about a few things about it, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So what was, um, what was the thing that like got you back? So you said you loved fashion as a child, obviously with, you know, Barbies and Bratz, and then you got more into video games, but you were like still like into like fashion video games, you said, but then yeah. like what, what brought you back into loving fashion again? Was it like specific designer? Was it a collection? Was it just like maturity? Like what was the thing that brought you back into it? Um, I think for me, it was just like, at some point, I just looked at myself and I didn't like the way that I dressed, essentially. And I wanted to kind of explore like a little bit, like a little, like a few ways in which I could improve my sense of style. And then mm -hmm. I think that that's when I really started to get back into fashion. Like, I think that like the one, I mean, like I hopped on Pinterest and the first collection I saw was a Dior by Galliano collection. And I just... I just, it's like, 
it's like I never left from when I was a child. Like every, I just fell in love with it all over again. I started just going on this rabbit hole of just, oh my God, Dior by Galliano, and you know all of all of these other amazing designers and everything, and all of these amazing eras of fashion and stuff. Funny enough, I was a huge Dior girl, but I think I wasn't updated. I wasn't really updated with like current Dior whatsoever at that time. I was just going into through like the archives of Dior and I was just absolutely obsessed. I couldn't get enough of it and stuff. I feel like obviously my opinion has changed a bit more now that I've ed educated myself a bit, but like just going through all of the archive looks, you know, like, you know, vintage Versace, Gianni Versace and everything. And just basically like, just relearning about it you know what i mean like i obviously like everybody knows who you know, like the dior by galliano era everybody knows the gianni versace era and you know everybody knows the 90s supermodel eras and everything but i think that like i think it took going back to that in order for me to kind of like be like but i want to learn more i want to like i want to learn even more about it and i think that that's when i started getting really invested in trying to like learn more and i couldn't find a proper platform to learn about it beyond pinterest and i somehow found myself on twitter after that i actually had a very normal account on twitter i wasn't really posting much and then one day i just came across fashion twitter and i saw a lot of very talented very knowledgeable people and i was like oh my gosh i need to stay here and i need to learn from these people because they obviously know what they're talking about yeah that's super interesting um yeah I, I feel like a lot of fashion twitter really likes to dive into like the archives and vintage looks and so that's yeah. interesting that's that's what got you back into like loving fashion because you go back and you see these designs and they just like completely blow your mind like whoa they were making this you know 10 years ago 20 years ago which is like yeah. so crazy then and it's so different than what it is today um Definitely. yeah so um you know where you grew up what was like the fashion scene there was it uh um you know or did you were you around people that were wearing like you know european brands or like what was like the fashion scene where you grew up when i grew up like i would say that like it was kind of a mix of you know like very normal modern clothing as well as a lot of traditional wear so like that hasn't really changed currently to where I live now. Obviously, like it's a different, like it's different cultures now. But like where I grew up, like um, there were a few people that did wear like you know like European sort of like clothing or like American clothing and stuff like that. But I think for the most part, like it was very much like I was very much surrounded by very normal sort of like outfits. Maybe it's just because I was very young and I couldn't really notice much but like for the most part like it was very much modern clothing as well as traditional wear which i think was my favorite part of just like being a child and everything although like you know when you're a kid you don't really appreciate it as much at least i didn't because <laughs> i thought because oh, this is photo of me when i was like i think like six years old it was my brother's birthday and my mom put me in this two-piece set like of ankara clothes it's like this blue it's super beautiful but back then i really didn't want to wear it and i still mm. don't understand why <laughs> so it was kind of like that like very much like a mix between the traditional and the modern which i think kind of encompasses how a lot of like african countries are in terms of fashion even today taking a quick break from the show it's a new year and what better way to set the vibes right than with a new luxury candle from salt and stone Salt and Stone elevate any room with their clean, elegant design and the variety of refined fragrances that make any space smell immaculate. These candles have a 55 hour burn time and they are formulated with vegan friendly ingredients. I have personally purchased the saffron and cedar candle before and it smells incredible. They come in these elegant black boxes and they make a great gift. I only support products that I've actually tried and enjoyed. So if you would like to purchase a candle from Salt and Stone, click the link below where Amazon offers free two day shipping for Prime members. Now back to the podcast. Um, okay, so you were mentioning that um, once you got on fashion Twitter and you found that community, that that was something that you really wanted to stay and 
um, you know, start contributing to. So when did like the it girl energy account start? Because you did say that initially your Twitter was just like a regular account. You were probably posting just like personal things on there. Um, yeah. And then now it's like become like a must follow for any fashion fan. So when did you start that that journey where you started to post like almost exclusively fashion stuff? Um, I, I would say it has to do with the fact that like when I when I first got into fashion Twitter, I, at first I wasn't like funny enough my my name my ads at wasn't even it girl energy at the time at all. It was literally something else that I literally can't remember. It wasn't even my name. Okay. <laughs> it was it had it had something to do with like Dior probably. But yeah. like I just I wasn't yeah, I I came through mostly because I noticed that like there was a lot of like diversity issues in fashion Twitter back then. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. anyone like on that has been on there since like for a while, for a long time will tell you, like there was hardly a lot of people posting a lot of, like many diverse sort of like people and designers and everything and i just felt like it got to a point where so many we would have the same conversation about like oh you guys need to be posting more diverse people and stuff like that and i got to that point where i was like okay but like i can be that person that like you know posts diversity and you know post people like people that look like me you know because at the time I felt like there just wasn't enough of it. And sure, like, I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm the person who pioneered this at all. Like, definitely not. Like, there was definitely more people out there that were also contributing to this. It was very much a group effort. But I just, I think I just got fed up of the fact that, like, you know, there was this conversation that just kept going on and on. Like, oh, fashion Twitter is just not diverse enough and everything. And like, yeah, it's definitely not perfect today either. But I just wanted to change that somehow, you know, I wanted to have people that look like me feel okay with following somebody that like post fashion, but also post people that also look like them, that represent them in a sense. Because like, while like the fashion industry has made like small steps to kind of like make this better, I don't think that it's there yet. And I just wanted to kind of like create a space where everyone is welcome and everyone is like can see themselves to an extent um and like sometimes i have to sometimes kind of i look back at all of at how it looked before and like how it was very much like dull era her early 2000s models that were being posted only and compare that to today and it's like such a stark difference and everything and even though i, I wouldn't say that i'm the person that like made that happen by myself like definitely not I definitely want to pat myself on the back for like at least trying to contribute to a change. And I think that that's the main, like one of the main other reasons why I joined fashion Twitter. Like I just wanted to change something, you know? Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And like you mentioned, um, when you're like posting photos of like these vintage archives, like a lot of these models look the same, right? They're like yeah. tall, white and slender. And then yeah. if you look at it nowadays, now you have, different body types, different colors. You know, we even have, you know, transgenders walking the runways now and um, which yeah. I think is fantastic. You know, fashion should be inclusive. It should be like everybody should be welcome to this, this art, this industry, anybody that wants to be a part of it and contribute. And so, yeah, yeah I think uh, I think what you did is just fantastic. So in your opinion, it has it got a lot better over the years. I think that like for the most part at least the people that i follow like they post a wide range of like so many different types of fashion like i feel like I, I, there's so many facets in which you can learn fashion and i think that like that's what that's what i wanted fashion twitter to look like for a very long time i didn't want it to just be like focused on like just you know western european fashion like i feel like i could learn about like an indonesian fashion designer like today and I can learn from like a Palestinian fashion designer tomorrow and I think that that's what fashion Twitter should be and you know I, I, I also want one day to kind of like learn more about like other cultures and other designers as much as I post like as you know diff a variety of designers today I want to be able to like post even more and I want to be able to like post as many people from like different areas and different parts of the world because there's there's just not enough of that, you know? Like, I feel like fashion is very, like, you know, Western focused. And it's very hard to kind of get out of that bubble because it's so, like, concentrated 
you know and one day i want to be able to just kind of see much more variety but like it's very much a work in progress because a lot of countries for example kind of bar you from like going into like learning from uh their like pond and everything and like for example like i would love to learn more like from shanghai fashion week and I, i'd want to learn more about from like shanghai designers but like last time that i tried to look up any info a lot of information from it i was very much barred from it so i had to learn from other mutuals that actually live in areas where they can actually access that information you know what i mean and i want to get to that point where like we're able to like sh share more of that and yeah i don't know this is just a ramble now <laughs> yeah so so when you talk about barred from it is it just um like you try to it's reach out like to these people or no, it's mostly like just I think that, like international issues and everything because like sometimes I have to get on VPNs to like actually oh, right. hop on like their servers and stuff like yeah. that. Like and I think yeah, I'm unfortunately in part of like a country that can't reach those servers. <laughs> so oftentimes I have to rely on other people to kind of give me the information. Yeah, and I think you bring a really good point because you know, anytime Anytime Paris Fashion Week shows, like everyone's posting that, right? It's all the big brands, you know, whether it's like Louis Vuitton, Dior, Prada, during Milan yeah. uh, Fashion Week, like whatever it may be. But then, you know, you have these smaller brands, these like emerging designers, which are, you know, really important to the fashion ecosystem because these are like the really creative people that could create without any like any handcuffs, right? Like some of these big brands they have some type of direction from you know their big bosses that say like hey yeah. you need to make some some pieces that are very sellable um you know that that we can bring to the mass market and some of these small like emerging designers in like shanghai or tokyo or whatever it may be uh um, yeah you know a lot of them are like just super creative because they could create at you know what they want at their own pace and things like that and yeah. Um, yeah, I, I do wish that these smaller designers were like, you know, shown at more of a national stage and, and covered more because I think it's like super important to like have these designers and have their art forms still be spread out throughout throughout everyone that loves fashion. Definitely. Um, yeah. And, and you're definitely a person that does that all the time. Like, you know, a new collection comes out and um, a lot of times I don't even know it's coming out until I see you post it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's it's one of those things where I put a lot of pressure on myself to kind of like, because, oh, man, with with uh, with Twitter, you have to strike when the iron is hot. Like, you need to, like, or maybe this is just a, a me thing, because, like, a lot of people don't post like me. I just do this because I kind of view, like, posting on Twitter like, kind of like a game. Like, mm -hmm. you have to strike when the iron is hot. You have to do it once. And if you don't do it fast enough, then you lost type of vibe. And I shouldn't be thinking this way, but this is just my perfectionist side coming through. I want, I, in my head, I want to be the first person on the scene, even though I'm not there. Because, like, in my head, I kind of want to, like, make my followers feel as if they're there. Because I want to feel like I'm there and mm -hmm. everything. This is just another way of me being delusional. But, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I just want to feel like I'm there more, more than possible. So I usually just go as fast as possible and i think and I, I i look through all of my archive posts that i've posted and oh my gosh this person is wearing the scaparelli collection from three years ago i remember this because i looked at this collection like three days ago let's mm -hmm. let's write that down type of vibe and yeah like <laughs> it's definitely not easy and i've like when i was talking to a friend about it my one friend was telling me like sometimes you need to kind of relax because like you don't get in, like much sleep because all you do is just like spend like hours downloading pictures as soon as they come out and everything and post them as fast as possible and everything. You don't have to do that, but in my head, I kind of do. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was going to ask, um, because I feel like you have this like uncanny ability to post photos like immediately as they're available. Like I can't remember what show it was, but I think I went to Vogue runway to look at photos and they weren't yeah. up yet. But then I went on Twitter and I saw you had them. I was like, how does she have them faster than Vogue? Um, so, so like, what's your secret? How do you post these photos like so quickly? I think I'm just very efficient on the computer. Like this is what happens when you do a whole degree on your computer. You just, 
you just become very good at like taking things and saving things and removing what needs to be removed like and just posting them i'm just very i i just have very quick fingers because i see something and i'm just like wait i know exactly how to remove this watermark or something and i can just post it and stuff and i don't know i actually don't know <laughs> there's no actual direct answer to it other than you just have to be quick with it okay my my conspiracy theory is you had like access to this like secret fashion database that they gave you to <laughs> is that not true absolutely not <laughs> if, if it was if it was it would make my job so much easier oh my goodness i wish i wish i could get sent stuff and be told okay please post these pictures we're sending them to you like three hours before the event even started yeah no, I'm, I'm just i'm just very efficient on a computer yeah i must say like you are like it's just like so quick how, how you get these photos out there like i said like you even get them faster than Vogue sometimes, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, sometimes the Vogue Runway app just sucks, though. Like, and I just rely on the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's definitely times where it's like very delayed. Like, they won't get photos until like six hours after the show, and then. But it seems like the big shows they have like immediately, but some of the smaller shows like it usually take some time. Mm, definitely. It's a new year. And if you're a guy looking to elevate your skincare routine and products, I have the perfect thing for you. The Jack Black Skin Savior Set provides everything you need to get the best skin in 2024. I like Jack Black. I've used their products for years. So I can honestly say this is quite the deal they are providing with this package. This set comes with four products, and they are the Pure Clean Daily Facial Cleanser, the Face Buff Energizing Scrub, the Double Duty Face Moisturizer with SPF 20, and lastly, the Intense Therapy Lip Balm with SPF 25. I love that they're including their moisturizer with SPF. It's important to wear some type of sunscreen every day before going outside. So click the link below and purchase the Jack Black's Skin Savior Set and make skincare your priority in 2024. Um, so I know obviously you have like this big following on, on fashion Twitter and uh, other social media accounts. Um, yeah. Do you ha so like I know like everybody that's like into fashion seems to follow you, but do you have any like big brands or like designers that follow you that you were like, whoa, like I can't believe so and so was following me? Oh uh, yes. Uh, so Coach follows me, which okay. is probably the biggest brand that follows me. Like apart from maybe like the owner of Mirror Palais follows me on Instagram because oh, he's not wow, very okay. active on Twitter. And I think the the owner of Hanifa also follows me. Okay. There probably are others, but I just I, I got I've gotten to the point where like my following is way too big, and sometimes I I just I just don't notice these things until it's like three months later, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> why did Marcelo Gaia just like my picture? And then I check the profile, and it's like, oh my gosh, why did how in the world when in the world did this happen? When did they follow me? Yeah, and that type of stuff. Like literally the other day on Threads. Oh my god, nobody uses Threads, but like on Threads, DD Stone, who is like a huge French influencer, followed me, and I was just like, "When did this happen? And how did that happen?" And it's really hard to keep count of who follows you and who doesn't. And it's it's kind of like, yeah, that's the. I think that's the biggest curse of having a big account is like you just don't know how to keep up with like who follows and who doesn't anymore but it's also kind of like a blessing because you don't get obsessed about numbers as much or maybe i just don't because at that point i'm just like man i already have such a massive audience there's no way if it gets bigger than that then that's great and then if it doesn't it's still like a massive audience so maybe i'm just i'm just not ambitious enough about it but <laughs> i'm always just praying in the back of my head that like it'll get bigger somehow and if it doesn't that's okay i will I'll, it'll get bigger or not i don't know i try my best to kind of like not be obsessed about the numbers as often but yeah it's just hard to keep up with everything sometimes so i tend to just not look <laughs> um so i know fashion or um on twitter is your biggest following right what other social media accounts do you have that you like like to post fashion stuff on um i do have instagram now like i have like a proper fashion instagram i used to just do like a hybrid of my personal life and like fashion 
on mm -hmm. my personal account, which was growing pretty nicely, but I just found it very clunky because I just, it's like, yeah, I posted like a tribute of Vivian Westwood yesterday and now I'm posting about my personal, like a selfie the next day. Yeah. I just felt really <laughs> awkward. Yeah. I just felt really awkward doing that. And it felt like, yeah, I just felt like I wanted to kind of separate it a little bit because it would be a lot easier to just post like fashion, fashion, fashion. And whenever I wanted to, if whenever I want to kind of like, you know, post something fashion related on my personal profile because it matters to me, then I just like, add myself as a collaborator collaborator um uh, on both of my instagrams because then people are able to kind of follow both of them although right now like you know my my fashion instagram is going pretty well but i only started it like three months ago <laughs> no two months ago but so it's very much very tiny but we'll see by the end of this year <laughs> okay and then you said you have a threads do you have a TikTok as well i have a threads i don't have a TikTok mostly because i just like I haven't fully, well, actually, you know, this is a lie. This is something that I have been working towards for a very long time, but I've been wanting to make video content for a while now. Mm -hmm. I just, I did do like one review of, I don't know. I don't remember. I think it was the video music awards. Like last year I did like a small video and I posted it on my personal profile on reels and everything. And people seem to very much enjoy it. But I was, as I, as I probably, as I told you before, I'm very awkward in front of like a camera and on a mic and I tend to ramble a ton. And yeah, <laughs> I know that you can just edit that out, but like, it's just, it gets to the point where I'm just, I just ramble too much and I just look at myself and I'm like, oh my God, you look super stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. And it's hard to kind of like build the confidence to just go on and just do it. But I think this year, I think that like, Maybe it's just because of the way the year started, but I just, I felt mo so motivated to just do stuff. It's because like when I posted, for example, like my digital scrapbook on Twitter and stuff mm -hmm. like that, this was very much something that like I had been working on for a very, very long time. And it's stuff that like I know how to do because of my degree. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I should do this, but then I was like, you know what, fuck it, let's do it. And so many people seem to very much enjoy it. So I'm definitely going to bring up more stuff, but then, like at the same time, I was like, okay, so if I'm willing to do that, then I have to be willing to do video content eventually. Um, and, but I don't know if TikTok is my type of space. I don't know. Maybe it just, doesn't, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just scared or maybe I'm just too rambly, but I've always wanted to do YouTube instead because then mm -hmm. I'll be able to kind of like have longer thoughts. And I know you can have longer TikToks, but I feel like TikTok is very much a platform for like fast content, like, you know, very much short form content, kind of like Twitter in the sense that like, you can't have the same content that you post on YouTube on like TikTok. You have to more have like a more condensed version. And unfortunately, as you can probably tell from how much I'm talking, I don't really do condense very well. <laughs> I have to somehow, I have to somehow do the things. And sometimes I have to restrain myself from talking too much on Twitter. And I do that a lot, but you know, I, I guess people like that as well. And that's why I created Instagram. But yeah, that's pretty much why I haven't, I don't have a TikTok. I'm just, maybe I'm just scared. Maybe that's, that's <laughs> what I'm, I'm getting at. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think with your huge following, I think a lot of people would enjoy like hearing your voice more and, and hearing like comments on, you know, whether it's like a red carpet event or, um, you know, some type of like runway show or collection that's coming out um yeah. yeah so like honestly like the best way to fight fear is just to put it out there right i mean everyone's scared to try something new initially yeah. but then once they start doing it and i mean you have such a huge following it's like so many people are going to be there to support you either way is it just me or does anyone else get skin blemishes at the worst possible time the one product that i have used over the years it works wonders and the name of it is mario bisco's drying lotion this thing is a miracle worker if I ever have some type of breakout or blemish the day before an event or special occasion, I use this drying lotion to target the blemish while I sleep. All you have to do is use a Q-tip and dab a small amount of the product on the blemish at nighttime before bed and let it work its magic. In the past, a large majority of my blemishes were dramatically reduced overnight. Like I said, this is a miracle worker. This really is a product everyone should have. 
If you would like to purchase it, click the link below for the Amazon store where they not only offer the liquid form, but also small drying patches as well. Now back to the podcast. So uh, I did want to talk. So you made this scrapbook um, that highlighted some of like your best moments of like 2023. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask like for last year, 2023, like what was your like favorite collections? What were your what were the designers that like really impressed you last year? Um, was there any like, you know, show that you were just like completely blown away by last year? Yeah, I mean, I think that like the show that blew me the most away was uh, Scaparelli Couture uh, Autumn mm -hmm. Winter 2023. I'm, I hope I got the season right. I'm relatively sure I did, but like it was very much like, like, okay, because I know that like the spring summer 2023, you know, the very controversial animal heads collection that came out. Of course. Yeah. That one was really controversial, but it was also like, while it had like some of my favorite looks that Scaparelli had ever come out with, it was definitely like not my favorite that they'd ever released. Like I think that mm. like the previous Couture collection was definitely better, but like with the Autumn Winter 23 one, the one that's uh, the, the one that like kind of like took, I think it took them like a few days before finishing the collection on the day of like th that they were showing at Couture Week. It was definitely my favorite because it was very much like a, a perfect, like explicit representation as fashion as art um and this is just me like be, being a fashion like an art nerd but like it was just like such a beautiful demonstration of like couture you know yeah and there was just so much beauty like there was so much like so many ideas that were there that worked out so beautifully like i just i, I still think about it today because it blew me away like i think about like that paint like sort of like uh paint dress that they had it mm -hmm. was so utterly mind blowing to me. Like it took me a few minutes to just stare at it while I was on Vogue Runway trying to get all the pictures out. I just looked at it for so long and I was like, oh my goodness, that, that is literally in the most explicit terms, wearable art. And I think that that's what blew me away the most. But I think the second collection, if we're talking about ready to wear is definitely Delara from the Koglu, hoping I'm pronouncing her surname right because I don't want to pronounce her surname wrong. Um, my favorite collection from them was, was Autumn Winter 23. They only released one collection last year, but it, Autumn Winter 23 was just such a fantastic, like, I think probably one of her best since, like, because, like, my, personally, my favorite, like, Delara collection is Spring Summer 23. Like, I wrote a whole thread about it because of, like, what it meant, like, meant implicitly, like, what she, the struggle that she went through as a designer, as a person and everything like and you know her struggle during the pandemic and stuff like that her mental health it was very much like all just condensed into that collection and i just raged on anybody that didn't understand it but autumn winter 23 blew me away mostly because it was just so like wonderful it was just so beautiful to just look at you know it was very much just like her you know how like when you watch like a smaller designer kind of come up and you watch them kind of grow in confidence and like very confident in their like uh, brand identity and who they are as a designer. I feel like that's that's the Lara for me. And I think that that collection just kind of like sealed the deal for me in terms of like, in terms of that. I think that like, especially cause like we got the knife dress out of that collection, right. the very iconic knife dress. I think that, I don't know, there's something so special about that collection like it's it, spring summer 23 is still my favorite in my opinion but i still think that like that collection blew me away mostly because one it was super popular like every single person every cool girl was wearing Delara. like it, like her collection was every cardi b was wearing it zendaya mm -hmm. wore it and like her spread and kylie jenner was wearing it and i just like i feel like that was that collection kind of like was the one that kind of catapulted her very much into like stardom and I, I just know that like if she is releasing a collection this year um because I, I haven't seen her name on the London Fashion Week schedule but like if she is releasing a collection this year I just know that it's going to be a lot more confident than before a lot stronger a lot more you know there and a lot more iconic than the last one and yeah <laughs> Yeah, and it's a it's unfortunate that she couldn't show 
um, was yeah. it last last fall because um, yeah, you know, just like the financial issues, which is like disappointing for her fa for her fashion fan, right? Somebody that like yeah. really likes her collections, but at the same time, like you understand, like, hey, we don't want you to go bankrupt just like trying to show this one collection. Like you have to think like long term, which we like Definitely. could understand and appreciate. And uh, yeah, I think Daniel Rosenberry for Scaparelli is just one of the best designers in the world right now. He's incredible. Um, yeah, so good. Um, yeah, so I'm glad you brought up uh, Scaparelli and you know Delara Findiglo. She's she's been phenomenal as well. Definitely. Um, yeah. So um, those are two that you like really said that you like really fell in love with, and um, you know, with with any fashion fan, I'm sure they could point to like some collections where I just like completely blew their mind, right? Um, yeah. W were there any designers or collections last year that completely surprised you? Where you were, where you were just like really like not really knowing like much about the brand or had low expectations, and then mm. you saw their collection or show, and you're like, whoa, this is like a lot better than what I thought. So I, this is just me not knowing much about Palomo Spain. Okay. Um, I don't. I I've I've never really like looked into their stuff, but like their last collection, absolutely stellar. Like I was so mind blown by how beautiful like oh my gosh the corsets the it was just so wonderful and i just couldn't believe it that like i hadn't been following that brand as much as i could another brand that i really really was very mind-blowing to me was chapova loena like okay like i don't know if it was just like such a wonderful like such beautiful skirts like they have the most wonderful brand identity and everything but that last collection was just so surprisingly like enjoyable to me like because i wasn't really into them much i, I wasn't I'm, i don't know maybe it's just not my style or anything but like i wasn't they weren't really on my radar for a while like with with collections or brands that i'm not really into i don't tend to post them because like i don't i don't want to like you know tell people that i like something when i don't actually like something I mm -hmm. usually just post stuff that like is interesting to me, even if it, I don't like it. But if it doesn't interest it, it doesn't interest me, then I don't really post it. But like Chapova Loena was a huge surprise to me because they have never really been on my radar until that last collection. Same thing with Marnie, to be quite honest. I oh, think okay. that lots of people were a lot bigger fans of Marnie than me. And that last collection was so good. It was just such a perfect mix between like very classic, gorgeous, sort of like modern, normal sort of looks. And then you got these really cool sort of like looks. The one, do you, do you remember the one that like Hunter Chaffer just wore uh, during the Hunger Games press tour, this pink look that she wore? It's stunning. Okay, you, you I'll need, have to look you it up. You need to look it up. It's it's, okay. so, it's so beautiful. And I was just so shocked at how much I love that collection. It was a huge shock. And I'm kind of a Marnie stan now. Yeah. All right. Um, are they showing during Paris Fashion Week again? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned that, you know, if you don't really like a collection, then you just like don't post them. I feel like you're never really negative on, yeah. on Twitter where... Um, you know, there's definitely some people that are, you know, if they yeah. don't like a collection or, de or designer, you know, if they're like, hey, like Demna from Balenciaga should be fired right now. He's like, <laughs> he's like ruining fashion, you know, like some people are just like to pound their fists and get really passionate about it. But to be fair, to be fair, I am also one of those people occasionally, <laughs> not as much, but that's only when it comes to Chanel and Dior. Oh, but the okay. only reason why I do it is because it's entertaining and people just love watching me <laughs> tear them apart. I feel like people think that I genuinely hate these brands and don't think that they can be better, but I literally just speak in a lot of hyperbole. Like, yeah. it's very much just me being like hyperbolic in the way that like I talk about them. It's yeah. just so funny. Like I yeah. feel like, like there was a tweet that like talked about how like fashion does need humor, and like you can definitely like see you know humor in fashion. But mm -hmm. like to me, humor in fashion is seeing a terrible collection and seeing like 
tons of these huge publications try to justify it. And then like a, like a high critic comes out with a scathing review that's just like, yeah. I don't understand why these these publications are saying this is good, this is terrible and yeah. stuff. And it's just, it's wonderful, truly. I try my best to not be too negative with my reviews, but like sometimes it's very hard not to be because people like like shock and people, okay, this sounds bad, but like, Twitter loves negativity. They love oh, right. it when you harp on somebody that's like, uh, that's especially like corporations and stuff like that. They love it when you like rip into them. And I think a lot of people that like get very passionate about these things, there's obviously people that do it because they genuinely feel that way. But I often feel like a lot of people that get mad are only doing it because they want like the shock value to kind of get, come to them and, be, and have people agreeing like, oh my gosh, I miss you know, the old Balenciaga, I miss this whole thing and everything. Like, honestly, like, I don't, I try my best, as I said, I try my best to not be too hard on a lot of brands, especially smaller brands, because I feel like smaller brands, they don't have as big, or bu as big budgets to be as, you know, like, polished and perfect and, like, you know, these money-making machines that, like, these huge other brands are doing. But I think that, like, I think that that's why it's easier for other people to kind of, like, go after brands, like, you know, the big brands with huge sign value, like Chanel and Dior and Louis Vuitton and everything. Because remember when the Pharrell Williams collection came out and it was of very course. much divided and everybody yeah. had kind of different opinions and stuff like that about it. And it was just very interesting to watch because you either, like, one side was saying it was the worst collection that ever come out of Louis Vuitton men for a very long time. And mm -hmm. then there's others that said it was a very solid de debut and everything. And I was just kind of struck in the middle. And like, it's very hard to see like, very much like central sort of like, oh yeah, no, I think that this is an okay collection for what it is and everything. It's hard to see a lot of, a lot of that because Twitter is very much about big reactions. So yeah, I would say that, <laughs> I would say that like, it's all about entertainment in my opinion. Like when I make fun of Chanel, it's because it's funny. It's not actually because I, I hate the brand and I hope they <laughs> fail. Because <laughs> Chanel is Chanel. It's like a huge, like it's it's a basically a brand that represents what wealth is. It will always be a popular brand. It will always mm. be a brand that sells. It will never be a brand that people hate because like their stuff sucks. It's a high quality luxury brand that like pretty much has a huge fan base. But like, I'm still going to make fun of them because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you mentioned those brands, um, Chanel and Dior that you're just kind of like, you like to make fun of or kind of like be disappointed in. Um, yeah. Are there any other designers that you're just like, you know, I'm just not really like, I don't, not really liking the designer or their last collection was just like such a flop to me. Like, are mm. there anyone else? I think probably, like, funny enough, I would say Balenciaga. I just, yeah. oh, man. I, I don't want to sit here and repeat what everybody has been saying, but, like, I'm just not a fan. Like, I think that, like, there was a point where, like, Demna had had it and everybody was just looking at him. But, like, to me, these days, I just don't feel that way about him anymore. And I think that, like, he has such a massive audience that it's, I, I think... There was a time where it was really hard to critique him because he was on such a high and everything like Balenciaga was doing much better. But I think after the controversy, a lot of people kind of mm. took off their rose colored glasses and started kind of like, you know, seeing or like at least critiquing Balenciaga like a little bit more and kind of nitpicking a little bit more. It's a lot. It's become a lot easier to kind of critique him. It's kind of sad that it took the controversy <laughs> For, for that to yeah. happen because everybody should be like, you know, everybody should be able to critique whoever they want. As much as I love like uh, Daniel Rosemary's uh, Schiaparelli, there are people who don't and there are people who won't like a lot of his stuff and that's okay because yeah, but like with Demna, there was a point where it was impossible to even say some, one negative thing about him because everybody thought he was a fashion revolutionary, he was changing fashion. And this is not an argument without merit. He definitely did in a lot of ways. But I think a lot of people are very tired of his gimmicks and like his antics in terms of like, like 
everything that he used to do used to be a lot better and like the outputs used to be a lot better than how it is now mm -hmm. um and i think that that's just how i feel about balenciaga i used to very much like them as balenciaga i really love the way that he approached balenciaga but i just i got him to the point where i just get it just feels tired you know it just feels it's gotten to the point where i just don't feel as shocked or as interested or as you know amazed by what he does anymore because it's just not as good as it used to be or maybe that's just me <laughs> no i think you have a valid point i think that's a sentiment that a lot of fashion people tend to agree with in, mm. in my opinion um I, i'm not the biggest balenciaga fan either but i think mm. I, I think he does his couture collections very well um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of his couture collections so i think if he mm -hmm. brings some of those like you know more like the elegant elements to his runway shows i feel yeah. like it can make the collections a lot better but that's just that's just my opinion definitely i think it's it's hard to kind of like get that trust back after such a massive sort of like hit oh and stuff of course. like that especially especially with the like the recent collection the one that happened in la where yeah. they kind of like encapsulated kind of like the LA sort of vibe. Yeah, yeah. people did not like that one. Like yeah. people did not like that one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, it'll definitely be interesting to see like what happens with him, you know, within like mm. the next year, next two years, if he continues to make these type of collections and then, you know, we'll see what happens because he does have a huge fan base still. And like a yeah. lot of celebrities still come to his shows and, you know, people that love Balenciaga, like still ride for Balenciaga. And so it's, it's definitely, definitely going to be interesting to watch. No, yeah, I think I think that like Balenciaga today still sells incredibly well. So I don't think they're going to like he's going to go anywhere anytime soon. Like I think a lot of people like when the whole pro like controversy of that ad happened, a lot of people believed that he was going to get fired. But mm -hmm. honestly, I didn't. I've I i knew for a fact that he was gonna stay like I, as much as like you know this whole thing was really disgusting and gross and i just don't support it or post balenciaga like at all anymore like i think that like it's still a it, it's it's a brand that sells and at the end of the day a lot of these corporations really only care about money and you know because he has built up such a huge fan base like lots of people are going to choose him over the controversy um right. and if they his apology and like balenciaga's apologies are more than enough for like his the people that love him and love his designs like by the end of the day like balenciaga is an incredibly iconic brand and like Demna's time is very much an iconic time as well it's going to be like highly very highly it's very highly documented now so it's going to be very hard to kind of like remove that. It, it's like a huge point of, you know, for Balenciaga to keep in place. And I, I, I would imagine that like they wouldn't want to get rid of that. But that's just, yeah, that's just how I feel about it. No, I think I think a lot of people would agree with you in that sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so I wanted to move on to 2024. So yeah. um, what so we have fashion week starting later this week and uh yeah. you know for the men's so 2024 i wanted to know like which designers or collections are you like excited to see um for this year you know maybe some like designers or collections that you were like really impressed with in 23 and you're like really excited to see in 24 mm -hmm. or maybe they have new creative directors that you're like really interested to see uh it, in this upcoming year mm -hmm. Um, for me, I'm very the most that I'm very much looking forward to see like is very much the new creative director of Alexander McQueen. Right. Like I think that's probably my most highly anticipated uh, show to see. Like it's gonna be very difficult difficult for me to kind of like accept this new creative director because I, I feel like that's massive shoes to put on like i was speaking about this to a friend and like sarah burton has been working at mcqueen for over 20 years she was like mcqueen's last successor like he had chosen her she has been working with him since the 90s and it's gonna be so hard to kind of like see a an alexander mcqueen without sarah burton because at some point this was her brand you know, and 
I think that this new like creative director, like lots of people I've said have already brought up some opinions about him and said that like, oh, you know, he his work. I don't I don't remember where he worked beforehand. I just J I, J J W Anderson. Yeah, he worked at J.W. Anderson. And a lot of people have commented that like his work there was apparently very lackluster and they didn't really like it. So they didn't know how his time with McQueen was going to go. So I'm just, I'm going to keep my opinion the same way that I did for Gucci because when Alessandro Michele left Gucci, it was like a huge blow to a lot of his fans and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then when the new Gucci came out, there was a lot of like, divided opinions and everything but like the one thing that i said was that i was going to wait until the next collection to see how i felt about tabata de sarno at gucci so i'm probably going to do the same thing with this creative director but i'm also kind of very interested to see what his approach on mcqueen is going to be because we're so used to sarah burton's mcqueen like having like this special element of mcqueen like that direct link it, every single collection to me like by her just feels so symbolic and to not have that anymore at McQueen is going to feel very weird to me because she was such a huge part as to why, uh, why I wanted to continue learning about fashion so it's going to be really hard to kind of like look at this collection and think oh my gosh that's not a Sarah Burton collection at all it's so weird to see that and everything and yeah, it's it's probably my most highly anticipated show, but it's also like all, the Blue Marine, the new Blue Marine with uh, the new creative director that comes from Todd's. Yeah, I am so interested to see where Blue Marine is going to go now because like the way that they kind of expelled um, Nicola Brignano was kind of brutal. It was just came out of like fucking nowhere. Yeah, and yeah, it was very impressive. Like, I feel, personally, I feel like Nicola Brignano's time was very enjoyable. Like, I think that, like, because of the Y2K revival and everything, like, he did that probably the best out of, like, any other designer apart from maybe Diesel. Like, I think that Blue Marine probably brought back that essence of Y2K so well when it was still very much at, at its height. But I'm very interested to see which direction they're going to go for now. Are they going to go for something a lot more like <sighs> quiet luxury? I hate those buzzwords, but like mm -hmm. quiet luxury. Are they going to go for that? Or are they going to go for something a lot more to like, you know, their roots of very high feminine, very much like, you know, preppy princess sort of vibe. So I'm very interested to see like what direction they're going to go because his work as Todd at Todd's was really, really good. So I'm... I'm looking forward to it. I'm kind of scared to see how the brand is going to go from now on because one of the biggest reasons why I love Blue Marine so much was how distinctive it was at doing Y2K. It was very much like kind of reminding me of my childhood with like growing up with like Winx Club and everything. It kind of reminded me of that. So it's going to be very weird for Blue Marine to be like an elegant brand again, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think you bring up uh, good points for both of those because both of the new creative directors bring like such a different background, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, Sean McGurr for Alexander McQueen, he comes from yeah. J.W. Anderson, which is like a very like playful and kind of youthful and just like, um, you know, they just have like these kind of wild concepts, you know, like yeah. they had they had that hoodie last year that was made out of clay. Like yeah. that's that's not something that you would imagine like would ever translate to alexander mcqueen, McQueen who makes yeah you know beautiful gowns um yeah. so i think everyone's like super interested to see what what he does with that um, yeah what do you uh so there's a rumor that jock moose is heading to Givenchy as their creative director what mm. what do you think about that rumor and do you think he would be a good fit there um, I think he will like if he was to actually head to Givenchy, I wouldn't okay, this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but I'm excited. Lots of people have Me said too. that they really like yeah. you know his vision and everything, but like I really enjoy Jacques Mus for what it is. I think that like for what he makes, he is very good at it. Um, but also I think a lot of people forget what he was like when he was before he started going in a completely different direction. Like his earlier work was very, very different. 
well, not that different, but you know what I mean. Like, mm -hmm. it was very much, like, in the same lines, but, like, also very, very good. Like, Karl Lagerfeld acknowledged him and, you know, saw him as, like, a very good designer. And I personally think that, like, he would be an okay fit at the at the brand. Like, I would be definitely interested to see what he does with it, you know what I mean? Like, I think, for example, like, people have to kind of, like, I don't know, maybe it's just because I, I saw the way that, like, people were, like, so hyped about Peter Du at Almut Lang, mm -hmm. and then when the collection actually came out, people were really disappointed. <laughs> so I was like, everybody thought that Peter Du was going to be a perfect fit at Almut Lang because the aesthetic is very, very similar, very much in the same sort of, like, line of aesthetic and vibe. Yeah. But then, like, people were just like, oh, my gosh, this this was not what I expected. And, like, when his, his, like, his collection from, like, their own, like, brand and everything from Peter Du actually came out, people were like, oh, yeah, he left all of the good work for his actual brand and not for Elmut Lang. But, no, I actually, I'm excited to see if, if, if the rumors are true. I personally don't think they're true, but, like, if they were true, I would be excited to see what he has in like in store. Like I don't know. Like I've seen a lot of customs by Jackie Moose. Like especially like the one that he did for Bad Bunny uh, oh, at right. the Met Gala last mm -hmm. year. It was so good and like so well done. It was one of my favorite menswear look of the night. So I was like, oh my gosh, if he's capable of this, like what else is he capable of because i think a lot of people kind of group jackie moose as this you know south of france very beachy very like relaxed sort of brand but like we've never actually seen him like do like an ultra serious very much like um lots of clean cuts and very elegant and everything sort of things and so that when that look by bad for, that he did for bad bunny came out people were very shocked so i don't know if he ever does join like Givenchy, I am personally excited. I I'm I'm pretty sure he's gonna do okay. I'm pretty sure he's gonna do well, or maybe he's gonna not do well and completely fuck up and live up to everyone's <laughs> expectations. But no, I, I I actually think that he's gonna be he's gonna be fine. <laughs> um. So you said you don't think the rumor is true. Do you have any other designer that you think would be either a better fit or? someone that you think would be like someone that could uh, either promote from within or w what are your thoughts um i personally think that like Givenchy has gone through like a lot of like creative directors and stuff like that lots yeah. of people like they've like they've gone through like ricardo Ticci, claire white geller and now you know matthew williams and mm -hmm. stuff like i know like lots of people didn't like matthew williams tenure there but I think that like he had a lot of really good looks and I think his last collection, I think he was very much getting into like what his vision for Givenchy was supposed to be, but I guess it just wasn't enough. Like I think he took too long maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I think personally, I would want Claire White Geller to come back because mm -hmm. that's the Givenchy that I absolutely okay, I know that everybody grew up on like Ricardo Ticci's like Givenchy, but Claire White Geller's one was my favorite personally because it was very much just so good. I think like I, I personally think that like Sarah Burton would be a good fit for Givenchy. Like mm -hmm. this is just me. I think that like she would make it so she would bring such a different sort of vision for the brand that they haven't seen since Claire White Geller, you know? And I also think that we need more women female directors. Like, of course. Creative directors in, like, in the high fashion space because, like, there's too many. <laughs> there are too many male ones. And I'm just, yeah, I, I just want, like, Sarah Burton to continue designing. I just think that her, her mind is so gigantic and she is just such a talented designer. Like I just don't I just don't feel okay that she's not working for a huge brand. And I think that like Givenchy needs something like a like a huge revival. Cause I think that like they used to be a lot bigger back in like 2010, 2011 and 12 and stuff like that. But like I think they need a revival, something that like will really overturn the brand and make it the it brand again, you know? Because it was a such an it brand before and now it just isn't anymore. At least for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think you bring a good point. Like anywhere like Sarah Burton goes, I think a lot of people are gonna follow because she has yeah. like such a huge fan base, such a huge following. And plus, yeah. like, she has proven for a really long time now that her designs are really good. 
And uh, yeah. yeah, if Givenchy hired her, I think that a lot of people would be ecstatic about that. But really, yeah. it's like any brand she would go to, I'm sure a lot of people would be like super happy to to know like, okay, she's back creating and designing. We know she's yeah. like really good at that. And then obviously she's like built a fan base. Um, yeah. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Um, a lot of photos you also post are red carpet events. So a yeah. lot of like celebrities, um, you know, movie premieres and award shows. You know, we had a big one last night with the Golden Globes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, like, who do you think is like your or who do you think is the best dresser out there as far as celebrities and who are like some celebrities that you always look forward to seeing like, oh, what are they going to wear to? To this event oh that's a rough question because there are so many i have so <laughs> many favorites that i just love looking at but mm -hmm. i think currently like my favorite ultimate favorite that i can't wait to see what she wears for the next few red carpets events is fan bing bing and okay. yeah she is definitely like somebody that is just such a standout on the red carpet because she literally doesn't pull back punches like she will always pull something that is spectacular because she wants all eyes on her. And I think a lot of celebrities, I, I was having this conversation with a friend, but like I was talking about like how like a lot of celebrities just don't seem to like, either they don't know how to dress or they don't know how to like act in a specific outfit. Mm -hmm. And essentially my friend made a very good point of like, a lot of these celebrities are just there to act and they're not actually like, fashion icons they're not interested in fashion whatsoever they're right. just kind of given a dress and then they're just told to like dress up and stuff like that yeah. but i feel like a lot of celebrities <laughs> there's a lot of celebrities that absolutely love fashion and can you can definitely see it like another celebrity that i always look forward to seeing is cardi b on the red carpet uh -huh. she is such a like a ever since i saw her wear those thierry mugler looks on at the grammys I just, I couldn't get enough of her. She is such a beautiful, like she carries those incredibly like complicated looks so well as if she actually was born to be in them. Mm -hmm. So it's always such a pleasure to see her on the red carpet. Um, I would say, man, my brain is just gone blank now with so many so many celebrities this is what happens when you just spend all night covering red carpet shows and then not really like you know thinking too much further like doing all of that in one night but i think another person that i really really enjoy seeing on the red carpet currently is actually hunter chaffer like she is like recently her looks are so good but like i think just even before like she be, she started doing pre a press tour the press tour for the hunger games um she was just always a very good very enjoyable person to see on the red carpet because she is always like constantly dressed up in like something that fits her perfectly like i don't know who her stylist was before dara but i think you know like she just embodies like all of the looks that she wears really beautifully and like it's so interesting because i felt like this is just something that i brought up when like um rachel zegler and her on the same red carpet wearing completely different looks and i was like yeah no she's super capital but then like rachel zegler who plays a completely like a you know district 12 character in the movie is very much like much more you know styled down to earth but it, and it's so interesting because like she really does embody every single like outfit that she wears and i just love that about her it's like everything that she puts on just kind of fits her like a glove and everything like i'm just look, i just look forward to her every single time unconsciously like i think that like the, the last time that i saw her like the, the one that like i really really enjoyed from her was when she wore that rick owens look in, at the oscars i think e either last year or two years ago i don't really remember which which oscars it was but like she wore this really beautiful um rick owens look i think it was like this rick owens spring summer 22 look and she had her hair slicked back and she looked like an elf and it was just so mm. gorgeous. I just feel like she is definitely somebody to look out for on the red carpet because she just brings out like 
this energy about her. I don't know, she's just really cool. And like her looks are also always really cool. They're always something that like you wouldn't expect an actor to just pull and wear on the red carpet. You would really mostly see a lot of those looks in like editorials and stuff. But it works out for her. Yeah, I mean, there were like so many incredible looks last night. I mean, um, yeah. everyone from like Dua Lipa wearing Scaparelli to, you yeah. know, uh, what Taylor Swift wore Gucci and yeah. uh, Margot Robbie always looks fantastic. There's just yeah. like so many out there that just look so good all the time. Yeah. Um, so uh, I did want to touch on you said you stayed up late covering the Golden Globes and posting all these photos and commenting on them. Um, yeah. I do want to ask, like, I feel like you post every single day, you know, multiple times. It seems like all hours of the day you could expect like a tweet from Linda, you know, something fashion <laughs> related. Um, yeah. Like, how do you deal with with fashion burnout? Have you ever felt like burnt out before? Do you do you have like a method that you could like ease your way out of fashion to just kind of like decompress yourself? Or is, is that something you've dealt with before? Yeah, I've definitely like felt the fashion burnout before, like, and I felt it a lot, especially last year, because I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to create an Instagram, and I'm going to like, be serious about threads, and I'm going to cover every single, like, collection that I really, really enjoy, and everything that I find prominent, and I'm going to do all of these things, and it's, it gets to a point where it's very difficult to kind of, like, you know, have a a proper life where I'm not posting. Cause like, cause I think like, cause I started this whole account during the pandemic, it was a lot easier to kind of like focus on it. But I think that now, like I'm doing my master's degree, I'm also working and stuff like that. And it's, it's like, it's gotten to that point where like, sometimes I do need breaks. And like, although people make like, it seems like I, I post every single day. I really don't. Sometimes I just post a lot. And then the next day I don't post at all. And then people see the post that I posted the day before that. Mm. So that's how I kind of like calculate, oh my God. Okay. So this is how I'm going to spend the whole day working on stuff that like has to do with my real life and not my yeah. digital life, you know? And it's hard sometimes because I have to, because th- you have to think of things to say about it and like s- things to say about almost every show that you find interesting or prominent and everything. And you have to do that on across three social media platforms. And the thing is, because I'm such a perfectionist little twat, I just, I just want to get it right every single time. And I just don't. And when I don't, I just hate it so much. And I'm just like, I can't edit it. And it has to be there. It's on my record. So yeah, I definitely feel the fashion burnouts and everything, but I think like it's well, it's why I used to do these elongated breaks where I would take like a month away from Twitter oh, and okay. I would come back when something would be like important and everything. But I think that last year I found a, a really good balance where I'm able to do both and like like now my my job is like on social media so like it's a lot easier to kind of like you know take breaks from my actual job to post on my other job i guess um and also like just being able to just kind of like take time away from twitter while posting in between maybe like once or twice because when it's award evenings i post literally every minute <laughs> like i grab pictures i, re- I remove the 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 thing is the watermark and then I post them which was such a bad idea for me because now it's like an extra step that I have to take and it's just you might think it's not that much effort it really is because you have to wait a lot and it's it's terrible but like you take the pictures you post them then you have to think oh my gosh where's what is this person wearing did I spell their name right if I don't spell their name right people are going to eat me up on twitter this is terrible (laughs) this is not professional and yeah, like it's gotten to that point where like I'm able to I, I've I've taken a really nice sort of long elongated break where I'm not as active recently, which is why I was making certain tweets where I was like, Oh, I'm sorry for not being active because there's a lot of people that would DM me asking me if I was okay because I haven't been posting every day, which is kind of like a clue as to how much I post. <laughs> yeah. Just sometimes I forget how much I post because 
when I don't post, people get concerned and I'm just, I have to be like, hey guys, I'm okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, sleeping. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I'm sleeping. I'm playing video <laughs> games. I'm, I'm running outside with my friends and like, yeah, it's just been like that. It's been like, it's, it's basically how I'm able to deal with everything because I feel like if I wasn't able to do that, I would be so burnt out. I would give up on Twitter. Like there was a time, this, there are moments where I'm just like, do I actually want to do this? <laughs> or do I not just want like a, a, like a normal job where at a desk in front of a computer, which was my plan at the beginning, but now it's completely changed. Do I actually want to do this? But not, no, like I do, I really do. It's just that like, it gets hard sometimes. And, and I think that that's why it's also, because you know, what's interesting about like posting so much and, having so many followers and everything and like making like taking so much time from the day to just post stuff and like make sure the information is correct and comment on it as well like the interesting part is it's gotten so busy for me to do all of this that i don't pay attention to any hate i might get <laughs> like that's the coolest part about it i think because like i used to i used to obsess over it because like although my audience was like bigger than I expected before like I just I used to f obsess and be like oh my god if I fuck up then oh my gosh this person is gonna say I'm a terrible like I, I don't do fashion well and I don't comment on fashion well what am I doing but now it's just I've just gotten to that point where I post on three social media platforms I just don't pay attention to any hate but the only issue with that is that I also don't pay attention to too many questions and I only come back to them like two days later which is <laughs> you know not ideal but it, it is what it is <laughs> yeah well i think it's good that you have um you know a process that you know like hey i'm like starting to feel burnt out or i'm starting to feel a little fatigued from this you know mm -hmm. it's like okay i could just take a day to like post a bunch of stuff and then take the next few days off um yeah. but it is interesting that you know once you start to like step away for like a few days or a week you know, you get people checking on you like, oh, are you OK? And you're like, no, I'm just like <laughs> outside living my life for a minute before I get back yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard because it's so interesting because you would like because I don't post a lot about my personal life. That's not like academics or just random parties or like whatever I'm wearing that day. Like, mm -hmm. it's so interesting because I don't have much of my life on social media apart from my Instagram. And like, that's still like maybe 10 percent of my life. Mm -hmm. And like, yet it still feels as though people like think that they, they have this such, such a nice, strong relationship with me that they sometimes check on me and they're like, Hey, are you, are you okay? Cause like oftentimes when I like le left social media it was because of mental health problems, but now it's just because I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> it's just because I'm tired and I just don't have the, the capacity or the energy to open Twitter today. Other mm -hmm. than like maybe look at funny tweets and then go back to bed. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to get into, um, I guess a little more of your personal life. Like what's, what's next for you? Um, obviously this like social media account and everything you've done with the uh, fashion social media has like grown, like probably bigger than what you ever thought. What's, yeah. um, like what's, what's next for you as far as your career? I know you said you, you have a job and you're also getting your masters, right? Like how do you balance that? That's, that's so crazy. Uh, well, my masters, I'm doing that part time. So okay. like, it's definitely a lot easier to kind of uphold it and everything. And as I said, my job is very much on social media. So it's very much like easy to kind of, you know, balance everything when everything that you do, you can do from home or you can do like from the restaurant when you're hanging out from your, with your friends, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not like that it's not as difficult as it is, but like, I think it, there's definitely like a lot of like other expectations that I have in my life that make it, that hinder it a little bit, but that's, those aren't a really a big deal. But honestly, like I've always like, I'm obviously like I'm a game developer. I, I, I have a bachelor's degree in game development and I, the whole point I wanted to do my masters, I wanted to do my masters on fashion games. So I wanted mm. to kind of like integrate both my passion for, for fashion as well as my passion for games together. So I wanted to create a fashion game. I, I can't speak too much about it because it's a very complicated and very convoluted sort of whole, it's a whole thing. 
but essentially like it's about fashion games and how we can make them better because like what one thing i've noticed about like fashion games is that like like the fashion industry in general is that like they don't really pay attention to fashion games at all they t- pay more attention to much more mainstream games like fortnite and stuff like that stuff like that that, that mm-hmm. everybody kind of knows which is understandable on like a business pr- kind of like standpoint but it's very interesting that like the fashion industry does not like invest in into fashion games and so there's not a lot of like fashion games that like are in the mainstream and when they are they're usually like targeted to children or they're just not as well done or represent the fashion industry uh at a better capacity or like uh, beyond the surface level so i wanted to investigate that and pretty much like find ways in which we can improve that um and pretty much like that was why i wanted to do a master's degree and like why like basically like merging those two of my passions and i think that like that's why i'm also working so hard on cultivating and maintaining this huge platform because one day i want to be like hey guys i made a game i would love for you to play it so that like maybe one day it goes beyond like what i expect it to be that's the thing about like video games or any sort of master's project is that like it can go way beyond you know your university essentially and that's what i've wanted to do i've always wanted to create a very successful game as well as a fashion game and i've always wanted to, and now you know that my dreams in fashion are kind of slowly coming true i want to kind of bring the two together and stuff like that that's why it's kind of hard for me to kind of want to stay in one industry at the time because now i just i have so many like dreams and so many opportunities that are just right in front of me that it's hard to pick one you know and i <laughs> I guess that one day I'll, I will have to pick, but not for now. <laughs> that sounds uh, super interesting because that's like a full circle moment. Like you grew up, you know, playing these games, right? Like these fashion games, you said. And now yeah. you're like coming like full circle to like try to create one and one that's like better and like probably like more mature, not just for like little kids. Um, yeah. So that's, I mean, I think that's um, so cool of you to like think of that. Um, just like yeah. this full circle moment. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Linda. I mean, I really do appreciate you coming on. Um, everyone go follow Linda on social media. I'll, I'll put it down in the description. Um, again, so it was it was nice to meet you. Um, you know, you're an icon on fashion Twitter. So um, I'm really happy to uh, have you on this show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is the literal first podcast that I've ever been on. <laughs> Oh, like really? ever so yeah that's why i'm very rambly because i literally don't know how to <laughs> how to like approach it other than talk a lot so i hope i was okay <laughs> no you were you were fantastic you're like very thorough with your answers and everything so um thank you so much for being on thank you so much for having me all right bye bye thank you everyone for joining us please like the video subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time